We're excited that everyone is here today. We are right in the beginning of a sermon series that our pastor Toby started about four weeks ago. You guys are familiar with the name of that series. It's called Hidden Servants, Hidden Servants. And you'll remember in this particular sermon series, what we're looking at is that there are some servants in the narratives of God's scriptures that seem to have a front row seat on some of God's greatest miracles and God's greatest movements. In week one, out of the book of John in chapter two, we remember that Jesus turned the water into wine. Remember that? He instructed those servants there that day to fill the water jars to the brim, and Jesus performed a miracle. In verse 11 of John two, we read, Jesus did this, the first signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and the disciples believed him. So that was week one. Week two, we looked at John chapter 6, where we found a, another hidden servant, a small lad uh, with five loaves and two fish. He became the catalyst for God to feed 5,000 people that day. And in verse 14, similar to John chapter 2, an exclamatory statement, in verse 14 of John 6, we read, and after the people saw the signs of Jesus that he performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. He revealed that day his power. And then last week, 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman, a pagan king, had the disease of leprosy, and God used another hidden servant, a young girl, the maid servant of Naaman's wife. In verse 2, you remember that this young servant girl, this young lady, instructed her, instructed Naaman, if only my master would see the prophet in Samaria, he would be healed. And again, just like God has done throughout time, he chooses to use a servant to join him. The servant helped to change Naaman's heart. And in verse 15 of 2 Kings 5, we read, I know, Naaman said, I know there's no other God in the whole world except in Israel. And that miracle reached out and changed a pagan king. That miracle reached out and changed the nation, possibly at a time when the nation was a deadly enemy of Israel. So what is the summary of all this? What are we trying to say? In all of these occasions, God uses a hidden and unnamed servant to accomplish his plan. Like Henry Blackaby said in his work, The Experiencing God, God doesn't need us to accomplish his plan, amen? But he wants us to experience him. And so today, in a similar pattern, in Mark chapter 2, there are four unnamed servants who did everything they could to lower their friend into the presence of Jesus. So once again, God uses hidden servants. If you would, if you uh, will turn in your Bibles or your handheld device to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, again, a narrative that tells us about some hidden servants. I will read the scripture and we'll unleash the text. How does that sound? Here we go. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And when he, Jesus, entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no room, not even near the doorway. And he was speaking the word to them. Verse 3, they came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5, seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The next verse, verse 8, right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take up your mat and walk but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Final verse, verse 12. Immediately, he got up, he took the mat, and went out in front of everyone, and as a result, they were all astonished and gave glory to God, saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Now, you'll remember this is a passage of Scripture that we looked at a couple years ago, but Pastor Toby specifically asked me to cover this again. Why, I don't know, but we're going to do that. And I want you to see a couple things as we kind of move through our Scriptures today. We're going to look at every major character that we find in this passage, but we'll focus in the end on the hidden servants. There's three things that I want you to see as we move. You can write these down or you can just remember them in your heart. First of all, we'll talk about a word to the crowd, a word to the crowd. 
Then secondly, we're going to be talking about a word to the critics, and last, a word to us, the church. Are you ready? Hang on to your seatbelt. We're getting ready to go. First, a word to the crowd. A word to the crowd. What is the climate? What's the atmosphere? What's the catalyst? What's the context in which God worked that day in Mark chapter 2, verse 12, that they were able to say, God, we've never seen anything like this before. Let me just say it like this. We don't believe that God has a predictable formula, amen? God is not about spiritual hocus pocus. It doesn't mean that if I do certain things, then God will perform. What it does mean that there was an atmosphere, there was a climate, there was a catalyst that day that allowed God to work. And we began to see it in the context of the crowd. Now, what I want you to see, first of all, when it comes to the crowd, was that it was a crowd in verse 2, verse 1 and 2, who loved God. A crowd who loved God. Now look again, the Bible reads, and when he, Jesus came home, that's Capernaum, that's hometown, again, after some days, it was reported that there were so many people gathered that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. The Bible says that when it was heard that Jesus came into the house, that many people gathered together, there was no longer room, not even near the door, and Mark does a beautiful job of using a double negative compound in the Greek. It's a no-no in English. He says, no, not even room, not even near the door to explain the fact that the room was so filled it was spilling out into the streets. There were people everywhere. Now listen, you would agree with me today that a lot of activities can draw a crowd. Sports can draw a crowd, right? Concerts can draw a crowd. Protests can draw a crowd. Preachers can draw a crowd, or some of them. Churches can draw crowds, but when crowds are coming for Jesus and for no other reason, then they will be able to say, God, we've never seen anything like this before. Would you agree? Now, here's the context. Here's the context. The action all began in chapter 2, back in chapter 1. It was Capernaum. And we know that in Mark chapter 1, Jesus began his earthly public ministry And in verse 32 of chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus healed so many people in the town that nearly everyone in town was healed. But here's the danger. Here's the danger. And may we guard against it. Many people had gathered and flocked to Jesus to see what he was going to do next. Each miracle left them hungry for more, almost like a spiritual drug. Listen, let's not seek the manifestation. Let's seek the master. The miracles had eclipsed his message. Let's not be people who are more in love with a miracle of God than the person of God, amen? Let's not value what God can do for us more than who God is to us. I think you're asleep. Let's not value what God can do for us more than who God is to us. If we're going to unroof the roof, if we're going to see God do great and mighty things, and for no other reason, we need crowds who come and love God. Are you ready? We need crowds, secondly, who love the word of God. You already saw it. You knew it was coming. Verse 2, what did Jesus do? What did he do? He preached the word to them. Again, There are a lot of members of the crowd that day who I'm sure were curious spectators. They were concerned about the miracle of the master. Jesus was fully aware of the intent of the crowd. And the Bible says in verse 2 that he preached the word, the word of God to them. I love what Colossians 1.28 says. We preach Christ crucified. Paul said that. You see, here at South Main, let me just go ahead and make sure we're all aware, we understand. We're not going to make compromises with the word of God just to draw a crowd. We need crowds who come for no other reason than crowds who love God and crowds who love the Word of God. It's interesting and sad today to look around, even this week, in so-called denominations and churches who have removed the teaching and the preaching of God's eternal Word, and they've replaced it with sick and anemic substitutes, politics, woke values, cultural acceptance, progressive Christianity, and liberal theology infects many churches today. But as I said a moment ago, and as I said a few years ago, let me be bold and just make sure that you understand. As long as Dr. Toby Frost is your current senior pastor, and as long as you have the staff that you have leading this church, you will never have to worry about issues, topics, concerns that are infecting or going to affect the pulpit health of this church. We preach Christ crucified. We preach the inspired. 
We preach the inspired, inerrant, everlasting, ever-living, holy Word of God. And to illustrate its importance, the Word of God in our most recent proposed revisions of our Constitution and bylaws, we have put an exclamation point on that in Article 2 and Section 2. In that revised version that you'll vote on on July 24th, in the context of calling a senior pastor... It reads, and I quote, in the event that a senior pastor position becomes vacant due to health, resignation, or removal, the deacons will at the earliest opportunity nominate seven covenant members who agree to serve. They shall collaborate to seek out and nominate a candidate for senior pastor, period. That's what it says now. Here's the proposed added. The candidate shall be a man who believes in and is committed to the authority, the inerrancy of God's word, the Bible. Amen? Now, here we go. To even further illustrate... Section eight of the proposed changes that we are asking you to vote on. And in section three, the Bible is even elevated with our other teachers and leaders further to ensure that our church remains people of the word. We've added this statement. Under teachers, all teachers shall believe in and be committed to the authority, the inerrancy of God's word, the Bible. Amen? We need crowds who love God and we need crowds who love the word of God. Now, what was Jesus teaching that day? What do you think he was teaching that day? He's going to teach exactly what he taught in Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee preaching the good news of God. And there in Luke 5, uh, when we are given this same synoptic uh, gospel uh, occurrence, we know that Jesus said this about himself when he preached. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointing me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We preach Christ crucified. Now, here we go. Are you ready? You okay so far? You listening fast? We're talking fast. Here we go. A word to the crowd. A crowd that loves God, a crowd that loves the word of God, and a crowd who loves the world who's without God. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, Mark chapter 2. And they came, these four unnamed servants, bringing a paralytic carried by the four of them. The text says that these four men were determined to get their friend into the presence of Jesus. It's interesting that all synoptic gospels refer back to this. I believe it's noteworthy. And I think it's quite interesting that they must have known what was in store for this man. They must have known that physical and spiritual healing were possible. Possibly it was these four men who were healed in Mark 1 in chapter 1 and 14, who had also had an encounter with Jesus. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? I asked Chuck Rimsky this week, what would it take for us to lower someone through the roof? He said it'd be pretty hard. And I was just making sure because I can only imagine it was even harder in that day. Can you imagine in our morning worship service, right in the middle of Jesus teaching that four unnamed servants walk up, they're carrying their paralyzed friend. Again, perhaps they had been healed that same week before only to realize that the crowd was so great that they could not even get this man to the presence of Jesus, but their compassionate faith led to a creative faith. The four unnamed servants carried their friend to the top of the roof, and they began to literally unroof the roof. That's no easy task, is it, Kevin Russ? Because the Jewish ta- household was a typical one-story patio flat constructed of wooden beams and cross pieces of wood, much like our ceiling joists today. And crammed between that wood were things like thatch and grain and straw and mud and sand and tar. And on top of that, Luke 5 tells us that there was some tiles installed, so this was was not an easy task. They had to dig through. They had to pry up the trials, the tiles, an effective strategy, but no doubt a very noisy and disturbing strategy, all to get their friend in the presence of Jesus. They knew that the most important thing that they needed to do that day was to have an encounter with Jesus. Now, here's what I would say. They dared to do the difficult. What about us? Carrying someone to the top of the roof was not easy. Dare we quit doing the eternal work of God because it's too hard. The labor for the Lord is not easy, amen? But a labor for the Lord is not in vain. The results are eternal. Not only did they dare to do the difficult, they dared to do the unusual. What about us? Are we a crowd that loves the world who's without God so much that we're willing to try new things, not uh, preach a different message, but to try new things, these side doors of evangelism that we have from 
uh, sports arenas to other things in order to, to think outside the box, in order to do the things that no one else wants to do so we can become the church that everybody wants to be. They dare to do the unusual. They dare to do the costly. For these men, somebody had to pay for the roof and they knew it was gonna be them, but it didn't stop them. Think about that for a moment. We gotta pay for this roof, guys, but we're gonna do it anyways. Perhaps a year's worth of wages. Let me ask you, what's more valuable? The cost of the roof or the cost of a person's eternal soul? We know the answer to that. Are we willing to give sacrificially to the cause of Christ? so that no one at South Main, from the John Austins to the 80 others that we're gonna march across this platform, no one should ever say at South Main, I don't have enough money to go on a mission trip. No one at South Main should ever say, I can't play upward basketball or I can't participate in the Good News Club. They dared to do the difficult, they dared to do the unusual, they dared to do the the, the costly. Now, that's the crowd. Let's keep on. The second thing I want you to see Not only a word to the crowd, a word to the critics. A word to the critics. You knew it was coming. Sadly, sadly, in this passage, we've seen it over and over again throughout Scripture. Not everyone gets excited when God begins to work. Not everyone gets excited when God begins to redeem people, to save people. Why? Because sometimes it upsets their influence. Sometimes it upsets their power. Sometimes it upsets and changes their pew. But the first thing that I would want you to see that we need to be careful In the midst of having critics, we need to do what Christ did. A critical spirit becomes common. It becomes common. Look again at verse 5. Verse 5 in your scripture reads like this. Seeing their faith, that's Jesus, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 6, but some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your bed and go home. Verse five, verse five, Jesus saw their faith. Now, it's interesting, the Bible talks about faith that can't be seen, and all of a sudden, Jesus can see faith. But Jesus saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. Long before he said, arise, take up your bed, and walk, he told the man that he was forgiven of all of his sins. Now, the Bible said in verse 6 that there were some teachers. What was their position? They were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Now, remember who these scholars of scriptures are. They were were people who were given the duty of copying, hand copying the scriptures onto lambskins. These men, these scribes who were sitting there reasoning in their hearts had copied the scriptures so much that oftentimes they had become so familiar with a biblical text that they became scholars of that text and authorities of that text And it was the duty in Deuteronomy chapter 13 for this group, the scribes, to actually supervise the religious life of their nation. But here's the problem. Their interpretation of the law had become so more important than the law itself. In other words, it was they wanted to perceive and translate the law that would benefit them. This was not the first encounter, nor would it be the last encounter that Jesus had with a spiritual elite. The real paralyzed folks in this passage are who? It's the scribes. It's the religious leaders. They're paralyzed in their faith. They put God in a box. They set limits on God on how they believe God could work. And as religious leaders, I always think about it. Why weren't they out there directing traffic? Why weren't they giving up their front row seats? All they were doing is sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Now, here's a warning for us. As God continues to work here and around the world, there will always be critics who are familiar with the teachings of God, who find fault in the manner of God, the methods of God, and even the men and the women of God who work. Their fear is that God would become more powerful than their religious understanding. Their fear is that God would become more powerful than their religious influence that God would become more powerful than the religious following. So church, be ready. I dare say that even now there may be some critics 
Let's don't get in the way of interrupting what God may be doing. Let's be open and believe that God has the power and only God has the power to restore lives. Let's be open and believe that God has the power to save, to do the impossible, amen? A critical spirit becomes common. Now, here's a second thing that we need to talk about. A critical spirit, as we talk about a word of the critics, must be confronted. A critical spirit must be confronted. We already read verse eight through 11. What did Jesus do? Jesus proved he had a divine authority by telling the man, your sins are forgiven you. Now take up your bed and walk. Jesus, for the first time, is now forgiving people of their sins. Blasphemy later, that which would charge Jesus for his life in the court of law. This man, Jesus, has the divine authority to move and work in ways that he desires to see fit. And when you and I start questioning the power of God, When you and I start questioning the work of God, the word of God, be careful because what you're really doing is questioning the divine authority of God in your life, amen? Now here's what the word says, Isaiah chapter 55, eight and nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Hey, let's not miss what God may be doing here because it doesn't feel comfortable or it's against our preferred method. Jesus has the divine authority. I love what Toby talks about. He talks about often, we wanna become the church that we don't like, but our grandkids love. Let's not question the intent of God nor the authority of God. Let's not come or leave any meeting with a critical spirit, but a repentant heart, knowing that we're not God, amen? What was the first group of characters we talked about? The crowd. What was the second group of characters we talked about? The critics, here's the third, it's us, the church. A word to the church, a word to the church. The question I guess we should be asking is, what do we need to do today as we have dissected this text? What is it that we need to do? Again, being careful not to put a formula or some kind of easy believism or methodology or limits on God. In other words, that if I do these things and God will work, But there are some things I think that are so evident that we need to have today in our church. And the first is a savior must be present. A savior must be present. It all began in verse two with who in the house? Jesus in the house. Everything begins and ends with Jesus. It's only Jesus who has the power to forgive sins, amen? It is only Jesus who has the power to heal the brokenhearted, to restore marriages, to bring home prodigals, to set the captives free. Jesus must be present. We must welcome, invite, honor him in our midst. It must be about Jesus. Every song that we sang today was about Jesus. A savior must be present. Are we good? All right, secondly, scriptures must be preached. Scriptures must be preached. The word of God must be preached. We've already talked about it. The preaching and the teaching of the word of God is primary in all that we do. The Bible says that the word of God will not return void. The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God has the power to revive. The word of God has the power to clean. The word of God has eternity in its past and eternity in its future. We must have the Savior present and the scriptures preached. And thirdly, we must have servants who must be persistent. Servants must be persistent. Now, you knew exactly where I was going with this, but the servants, they didn't give up, did they? They didn't turn around, did they? No matter the role, whether we are seen or whether we are unseen, faith was the spark that began this entire passage into motion. Their faith was what? A persistent faith. Men who are willing to overcome any obstacle and man-made roadblock in order to get their friend in the presence of Jesus. Their faith not only was a persistent faith, their faith was a productive faith. They were willing to do what? Unroof the roof. Their faith produced works. Works didn't produce their faith. Their faith produced works. And because they were a believer, they knew that there was no other option. Thirdly, their faith was perfected. They were willing to let go of the ropes because they knew that Jesus was the answer. Jesus is the answer. And then in the last verse, we saw the people began to exclaim, just like we did in John 2, just like we did in John 6, there's an exclamation statement that talked about what people began to see. 
And here, they said, we've never seen anything like this before. I love what Luke 5, the synoptic passage, talks about. It says, they were filled with fear, saying, we've seen remarkable things. The word there in the original language means that I have been exposed to the person and the presence of Jesus that I've lost my mind. Isn't that cool? I hope today that we lose our minds. Now, we began by talking about the characters And I want to conclude by talking about the characters because every one of us today are found in one of these characters. First of all, maybe it's the crowd. You know what? I can't be too critical of the crowd. They did some good things. They really did. They came to see Jesus. But perhaps they played the role of a spectator more than the role of a servant. Today, listen, we need to move away from just coming to see Jesus and others to coming and experiencing Jesus for ourselves. I think it's time for some of us to step out of the grandstand stadium of our church onto the playing field of God's activity. We can't just be a church that has crowds. Secondly, you see the character of the paralytic. I didn't say much about him, but today we may have people who are paralyzed. I'm not talking just about physical paralysis. But I'm talking about spiritual paralyzation. You're lifeless. You cannot move. You're without hope. You're without reason. You have no reason to exist apart from the forgiveness of sin. And that's exactly where you've been looking for. Jesus today wants you to come to his room. He wants to save you. He wants to be able to tell you, like he told the man here in Mark chapter 2, that the Son of Man has the power on earth, verse 9, to forgive sins. Did you hear that? The Son of Man has the power on earth. If you're like the paralyzed man, you need forgiveness of your sins, and Jesus is waiting. And when he used the phrase, the power on earth, he's saying that this is the place to receive forgiveness now. When you lead this world in death, it will be too late to make eternal preparations. Today may be your day for salvation. The crowd, the paralytic, then the critics. Like the scribes, perhaps there are some people And I can get that way, ask Toby. I am a person of excellence. I'm a critical thinker, sometimes to a fault. Sometimes we unintentionally or maybe even intentionally take on the role of a critic. Perhaps we've had a spirit of doubt or a spirit of destruction. Maybe we've kept this church from seeing all that God wants us to see. And maybe today you need to repent. Maybe you don't need to come tell me, but maybe you just need to tell God and ask God to forgive you and repent and, 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 and beg God that you would not interfere with what he may be doing. Or maybe you've hurt someone else and you need to go to them privately. Maybe you've been a critic. Or maybe today, just maybe our church is filled with unnamed servants. Unnamed servants, willing, dedicated, without their name even being mentioned in scriptures, willing to do what it takes to usher people into the presence of God. Unnamed servants are people who understand that it's a privilege to minister, un, to be a minister of reconciliation, amen? Unnamed servants are those who are willing to make a mess, to become disruptive, if God is getting the glory and if people are coming to Jesus. Unnamed servants are people who are willing to give up their seat in order that someone else can have the opportunity to worship God and fall at his altar, amen? Unnamed servants are people who are willing to get on a bus on a Saturday morning at 6 a.m. and drive three hours to Clarkston International Bible Church in order to teach refugee children from Afghanistan, like the young 10-year-old child that we met recently whose eyes were covered by a terrorist group while they slit the throats of her family members, are we willing to be unnamed servants for those? Are we willing to be unnamed servants by planting seeds of faith, believing that God is the answer to your faithful and your fervent prayers? Are we willing to be unnamed servants holding the hands of a sexually abused boy or girl, hearing their story of a mom or dad is showing them the love of Christ, but we're not finished. Unnamed servants are willing to give up their vacation to serve on mission trips to Atlanta, Africa, Montana, Utah, North Carolina, and anywhere else so that others can hear the good news of Jesus. Unnamed servants are people of faith, knowing without this faith that man can do nothing with God and God can do nothing with man. And unnamed servants are a bunch of senior adults who are not going to quit on God even when their bodies say so. Unnamed servants are people who know that God is attracted to desperation. How desperate are we? 
And here's where we began and here's where we're gonna end. God doesn't need us this morning to perform a miracle, does he? Focus right here. He doesn't need us. But just like Henry Blackaby said, he wants us to experience him. I don't know about you, but I want to experience him. Would you bow your heads this morning? Lord, we're going to give an invitation now, and we're going to allow our hearts to respond, to react to what we've heard, not the messenger, but from the spirit of the living God, the eternal God who created us and formed us in our mother's womb, the God who knows us and loves us in spite of who we are. Lord, you want to change us. Lord, I pray for all of those in our congregation today that need to make public decisions and those like me who need to make decisions in their own heart. Lord, some may walk down an aisle. Some may choose to bow in reverence where they are. Lord, I pray you would take a a church that has a crowd and move us out of the grandstand stadium and to your playing field and get involved in what you're doing. Lord, I pray for those who may be paralyzed in their faith. They've yet to receive Jesus, but just like you said, today can be their day of salvation. Lord, give them strength, boldness to walk down this aisle today. Lord, I also pray for critics like me who can become very quick and judgmental of activities and even people. And Lord, I pray that today we would recognize that we're not in charge, you are. Only you have the authority to forgive sins. And only you can say, arise, take up your bed and walk. Lord, I pray that we will guard our hearts today. And Lord, if necessary, we would go to others that we've hurt with our words, silent or public, and seek forgiveness. And then, Lord, I pray for unnamed servants. I can't imagine what would happen if every one of us, including me, Lord, were to be an unnamed servant this week have persistent faith, productive faith, and watch you perfect our faith. So Lord, if there are those today who need to come and join our church and say, I wanna be part, or those who are already here as a member or just a regular tender that says, I need to be part today, Lord, they, Lord, can come and we gladly will receive them. Now, Lord, just like Mark chapter two, we've never seen anything like this before. May it be about you, not us. We pray all of this in the expectant name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Would you stand and would you respond? Ever how God may be leading you? We're here to receive you. You come.